Hey y'all, welcome to the Love Subscribe podcast. This week we're doing things a little bit different. Instead of having a corresponding blog post to go along with the podcast, I'm actually doing an episode separate from my blog, and I'm going to be talking about an aspect or a facet of the New Apostolic Reformation today, in particular on apostles. What got me thinking about this was, A, I was actually involved in this type of movement without even realizing what I was in, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that from personal experience, as well as to point you to a resource that was very helpful for me when I was coming out of what I was in because when I came out of what I was part of, the church I was part of, I began to devour information of trying to figure out what I'd been a part of, where the deception was that I believed, what was biblical, what was unbiblical, and this was one of the resources that I stumbled across and it was greatly helpful to me, and I want to share it with you today. But before we get into those things, I want to focus on Scripture in particular, because as we know, as believers in Christ, Scripture is the infallible Word of God. It is sufficient for instruction, for training us up in righteousness, and for correction. And so when I started thinking about apostles and what true apostles look like, which we are going to talk about that from a biblical standpoint today, maybe you're a person that believes that there are still apostles today, and I want to show you in Scripture what the qualifications were of an apostle, and you may have heard these from elsewhere. They're not hard to find in Scripture. It's pretty plain and lays it out for us what a true apostle looked like. So before we get to that and the other resource I was going to share with you, let's look into scripture for just a moment. And we're going to look at an account in particular and then talk about what the qualifications were for a true apostle of Christ. The ones that laid the foundation according to Ephesians 2.20, the apostles and prophets who laid the foundation with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. In Acts 17, we see a well-known passage that many of us are very familiar with, and it's when Paul encounters the people in Berea. I want to read to you this account beginning in Acts 17, verse 10. It says, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea, also they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. So I want you to notice something even in this short little passage that we're going to look at to lay the foundation of what we're talking about today is that Paul was an apostle appointed by Christ. We know this in Galatians that he many times in Galatians, Paul says he's an apostle of Christ. He's a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And in particular, when I think of Galatians, he makes it very plain and clear to the people in Galatia, for example, that he was called as an apostle of Christ, that he was given the gospel by Jesus Christ himself. It was not given to him by any man, but that he was given the gospel and the gospel was revealed to him by Jesus Christ himself. And he was called as an apostle in first Corinthians 15. I believe even Paul refers to himself as the least of these apostles born in an as one untimely born, I believe is how he words it. And this is basically to point out that he was not one of those that was walking with Jesus during his earthly ministry, but that he was, he was called as an apostle by Christ on the road to Damascus. And he was revealed the gospel and began to minister the gospel after his eyes were opened and he received Christ as his Lord and savior. And he began to preach the gospel and he laid the foundation for the new Testament in order for the church to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, having been fulfilled and seen in the even in the Old Testament, which I just want to remind you, just to kind of think about this was was something I had never thought about before until I under began to understand better reading the Word of God. Think about it, they did the the early church in that time did not have the New Testament scripture before them. Therefore, how were they ministering the gospel? They were ministering through the Old Testament. So the Old Testament was the type and shadow, but it was always pointing back to Jesus Christ. So they were ministering the gospel. Well, what passages or scripture were the Bereans looking at in Acts 17 to test Paul to make sure that what he was saying was so? They were looking at the Old Testament. And so we see in verse 11, it says that, Paul is actually commending these people. He is saying that these Jews were more noble 
than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness. What word? The gospel of Jesus Christ. And they began examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. And many of them therefore believed. So we're seeing this in scripture that Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ, is laying the foundation here for the gospel for the first century church. And we're seeing that there's Jewish people that are coming to Christ. Now we know that most of the people that Paul ministered to in his ministry were Gentiles. Time and time again, we begin to see in Paul's ministry that he faced much opposition, in particular from the Jewish people. And several times, even in the Acts of the Apostles, we see Paul getting very upset with them and saying, I'm basically dusting my feet off, washing my hands, and I'm going to the Gentiles to minister to them because they are going to receive the gospel. But in this case, we see here that Paul is commending these Jewish people because they were more noble, and they were more noble because they received the word with all eagerness, and they also examined the scriptures daily to see if what Paul was saying was the truth. They were testing Paul, and Paul didn't have a problem with that because he was an apostle. And he understood as an apostle, as a teacher, that and laying the found work, foundation and the groundwork for this, that he was to be tested. This was a biblical way to handle someone who was teaching the Word of God. And the standard has not changed, oddly enough, even in the 21st century. We are still today, as believers in Christ, called to test what we are being taught by leaders. That doesn't mean that we're arrogant about it or that we're puffed up or prideful. It doesn't mean that we know everything because all of us, if we were truly honest, are growing and learning every day. And this just shows us our need for a Savior and our need for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because we are not going to know everything. Now, on the flip side, that does not mean because we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that we are going to operate in a mystical way and give an extra biblical revelation that's going to contradict Scripture or is going to even add something to Scripture that in theory, should be added to the end of the Bible, because a lot of times that's what's can ha- that's what can happen, and that's what happens in this movement in the New Apostolic Reformation. Without even realizing it, is if someone says, "Thus saith the Lord," or they're laying a groundwork and saying, "God showed me this this revelation that's new," then they're implying that what they're saying has authority to it, like these apostles, and that basically. They they may not be saying this, but they're implying, really, if it can't be questioned, that it should be added to the back of the Bible. And so we know that's not the case. So we see in Acts 17 that Paul, being an apostle of Christ, was very confident and comfortable with them testing what he was saying, and he called them more noble. And just to point you to a few passages of Scripture to give you an idea of his calling, for example, so you know that I'm telling you something from scripture we can see this in first corinthians chapter one when he's greeting the corinthian church he says paul called by the will of god to be an apostle of christ jesus and our brother sosthenes in first corinthians 15 when he is laying out the gospel of jesus christ which by the way is a very good passage to go to if you're trying to understand and get a clear and concise way to explain the gospel of jesus christ which is the death burial and resurrection of christ in accordance with scriptures is that we see that paul is detailing to the Corinthian people and he's telling them that he that Jesus Christ appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time this is in verse 6 of whom are still alive though some have fallen asleep then he appeared to James then to all the apostles last of all as to one untimely born he appeared also to me for I am the least of the apostles unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God In Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Paul, an apostle, not from men, not through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul greets the church at Ephesus with Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And so we could read on and on and see how he greets them. He, again, he calls himself a bondservant as well as an apostle because he understood that as an apostle, he was also a servant. He was not above anybody. He was not more anointed than anybody else. And he did not deserve to be reverenced or worshipped or to be clapped for when he entered the room or wrote to them. But he understood his place in the body of Christ, which was just like you and I as a servant. But he was also an apostle who laid the foundation for the gospel for the early church. Now, a couple of things I want to point you to as well before we start talking more about the NAR and uh, just talking about some personal aspects of this to share is there's also some passages in um, 
in the scripture that are quite interesting to reflect upon when you think about what a true apostle looked like. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we see in a few verses, let me start with verse 6, Paul begins to say to the Corinthian church, I have applied all of these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit. So right here, he's talking about the ministry of the apostles. And he goes on to tell them that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. When we're viled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still, like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things." It's interesting to me when I read this passage, and I, I mean no, I don't mean to sound glib in saying this, but when I read this, I am reminded of today in the current movement of the apostles and prophets. There is this very prideful or arrogant way that comes across the, um, of the dress, first of all. There is this mindset of being well-dressed and not liking when people are reviling you, when not liking persecution, not liking uh, quote unquote being slandered uh, or or questioned in any in any way. It doesn't matter whatever way you question. That's not permitted when you're talking to someone who believes that they are an apostle today and they carry a governing authority in the church. That is not permitted, and I have firsthand experience with this. It's a very interesting contrast when you look in the scripture of what this looks like in the first century church and what uh, Paul is saying. If we look at the history of the true apostles in, in the church, in the first century church who laid the foundation of scripture and they were, met the prerequisites in order to be an apostle of Christ, 11 of the 12 of them were martyred for the sake of the gospel. They were hated, they were slandered, they were killed. There's even accounts of, of John the Apostle, the one that, uh, the, the beloved Apostle, that the disciple that John wrote about himself, described himself as in the gospel according to John. Looking back in the historical accounts, there are things recorded that John was actually boiled in oil by the, the Caesar at that time. I believe that was Nero. I can't remember if it was Nero or Domitian, so forgive me for that. But the current Caesar, uh, Caesar at that time, the current Roman ruler, actually had John boiled in oil. And then I believe after that time, he was exiled to the island of Patmos. And he was the only apostle to die of old age. All the other apostles, including Doubting Thomas, were martyred for the sake of the gospel. And of course, we know that Paul was reported to have been beheaded, along with all the other things that Paul suffered as an apostle. The other place I want to take you for just a moment is 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This passage in particular, as looking through this account, this was really eye-opening to me when I was coming out of the movement I was involved in. And as many of you know, I have confessed to being a false prophet and not realizing that I was a false prophet, but I was called a prophet in the movement I was part of. Coming out of this and, and looking at even what Second Corinthians 11 had to say, it was really eye-opening to me because I began to see that Paul was facing these men in his day called, super, he referred to as super apostles, that were trying to override what Paul was doing. And the description that he gives these people is quite startling. So let's read a little bit of this in Second Corinthians 11, verse 1. He tells the church in Corinth, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. 
Indeed, I consider that I am not in, even in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preach God's gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone. For the brothers who came in from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. And what I do, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. And then Paul goes on to actually talk about and boast, so to say, in his persecutions and his sufferings as an apostle. This was one of the ways that he marked himself as a true apostle. He was willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel. And what really stood out to me as well is he talked about that he preached the gospel to them free of charge. It's another interesting aspect that you see in the NAR today that there's a huge focus on the financial aspect of always giving, always tithing. Now, there's nothing wrong with giving. In Corinthians, we even see that we are to give uh, with a cheerful heart and to give as we purpose in our hearts to give. And there are people that have some great teachings on what tithing actually means biblically. And for us to understand as the New Testament church, as the current church, to understand what real biblical giving is. And I encourage you to seek out those messages and take a look at those and and listen to them so you can have a better understanding of that. And he even goes on to address these visions uh, that that he had. He had a vision of heaven, which he couldn't even speak of, the things that he saw. And he, he even spoke about himself in the third person, which is also interesting. In the movement I was in, you hear a lot of people today write books and they have different things they release and they talk about having been caught up into heaven or they see visions of Jesus and they have all these things that they talk about, these elaborate things they talk about that things that are really irreverent, to be honest, that, that, and sadly so. I, I don't say that with, with joy or, or relishing saying that. It's really upsetting to see some of the things that are said. You know, seeing things that really are irreverent, and they're really more about the flesh and about, about us than they're about God. They're not exalting God in any way. It's really putting things on our own level and our own enjoyment and our own pleasure, rather than really understanding that we were made for, ultimately, we were made for Him. These were just some of the things that I came across. And even like I said, reading 2 Corinthians 11 was so eye-opening to me that I realized even then that some of the things I was involved in, I could see the the glimmers of it even today. I could see the shadows of it today that there are people that call themselves apostles. They believe that they hold a governing position in the church and that they are to be listened to and be followed. And when you come against them, they view it as that you're coming against God. So you may be asking yourself, what is a true apostle? If there aren't apostles today, which I will be, I will just tell you, I do not believe that there are apostles today. After reading what scripture has to say in context, I used to, before I read it in context, I used to subscribe to that there were apostles today. I no longer subscribe to that. And the reason being is because scripture is very clear in the prerequisites for an apostle of Christ. And let me lay these out for you right now. In Acts chapter 1, we see after the ascension of Christ on through, I believe, verse 26, there is the account there where Matthias is chosen to replace Judas. And we see that there's two different men that they can choose between. There's Barsabbas and there's also Matthias. Now, these two men were integral to choose from because there were prerequisites set, as Peter is going to explain to us in this passage, of what the, when the prerequisites were in order to be an apostle. Let's begin with verse 16 in chapter 1, the Acts of the Apostles. Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, 
who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. And they go on to talk about Judas, how he was uh, prophesied in Psalm 69, verse 25, and Psalm 109, verse 8. And it begins to say, So one of the men who have accompanied us, in verse 21, during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward the two names, Barsabbas and Matthias. They cast lots, and the lot fell. After they prayed, they cast lots, and the lot fell on Matthias. So right here, we are seeing a criteria that Peter makes it plain in Scripture, that the prerequisite, one of the prerequisites, was that this man had to have been involved in the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Other places that we can see this Uh, mention in scripture are found in Acts chapter 3 verse 15, Acts chapter 4 verse 33, Acts chapter 5 verse 30 through 32, and Acts chapter 10 verse 39 through 41. You'll see that in these different aspects that Peter, he comments several times in saying of witnessing the resurrection, such as, for example, uh, in verse 15 of Acts 3, he says, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. So again, he is alluding to the fact in these verses I just listed to you, and i encourage you please to go look these up on your own and double check them and make sure of what I'm telling you don't just go by what I'm saying to you but open your Bible and read it on your own and make sure that what I am saying to you is the truth just like the Bereans we are called to be like the Bereans that's an example that we can follow again it's not to be prideful it's not to be arrogant or puffed up or to have say I have more knowledge than someone else but this is to show that we are understand scripture and that we want to know what scripture says and to test everything and make sure that we're following the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember what Paul said to the Corinthian church? He told them that he was concerned about them being deceived like Eve, that they would, they were putting up with another gospel and another Christ that was being preached to them. It's the same for us today. It's just packaged in a different way. It's basically in a way to present something and may and say, well, this is the gospel. But when you start to tease it out and look at it further, it's not the true gospel of Jesus Christ. So this was one of the prerequisites for being an apostle of Christ. Another one was, is that they had to, they had the authority, the governing authority by Christ to lay the foundation for scripture to write scripture. We see this in Ephesians 2.20. This passage, again, is used quite often by those today in the NAR. If, and I know that a lot of people that are in, involved in that don't call it that, but for the sake of what we're talking about today, we're going to call it the NAR. So in Ephesians 2.20, we see that this verse is well quoted. I was very familiar with this passage. It's, it's actually stated of being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by his spirit. This is referring together as the Jews and the Gentiles is my understanding. And in Ephesians 2.20, this is not talking about people who currently call themselves apostles today and prophets today. You can't lay, I've, I've heard this many times, and so you've probably heard this from, from, uh, from Bible teachers and such, so forgive me if you have heard it. But if you haven't heard it, here's something to think about. You don't lay a foundation twice. The foundation is laid once on the building. And who laid the foundation with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone? It was the apostles and the prophets of the first century church. They laid the foundation for the church. And then we are building on top of that as the building, the body of Christ. So we see here Ephesians 2.20 in proper context is referring to the apostles and the prophets of the first century church that laid the foundation with Christ as the cornerstone for the passages of scripture So you don't lay another, continue to lay another foundation. That would, that's nonsensical. Even in building a house, you don't lay more than one foundation. You lay the foundation once and that's it. In Ephesians 2.20, this helps to clear that up. And we begin to see that even in general, you'll hear people say, well, if you don't believe in apostles and prophets today and you only believe in teachers and evangelists and pastors, then that's incomplete and it's not biblical. But 
look at it this way. You're, the apostles are still ministering to us today. And I don't mean that in a necromancy type way. I mean that the New Testament scripture was written by them and they are still ministering to us today through what they recorded being inspired by the Holy Spirit and guided by the Holy Spirit and carried by the Holy Spirit. Even when Peter talks about this, I believe in Second Peter chapter 1, when he is relaying as an apostle, uh, he being on the Mount of Transfiguration and seeing that take place place he is describing that he saw the the glory of God and he saw what happened to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration but then he goes on in verse 19 to say and we have something more sure the prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts knowing this first of all that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit you see scripture is prophetic in nature because it's testifying of Christ and it's a apostolic in nature and let me remind you as well that even in Hebrews, I believe that the scripture tells us that Jesus is the chief apostle. Now, there are some people today that will call themselves the chief apostle or master chief apostle or master prophet or, you know, whatever uh, additional super title they want to put on there. But Jesus is the main apostle. He is the, the high priest. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. But when we're talking about apostles, he is the chief apostle. But even in scripture, the scripture itself is apostolic in nature because it is laying the foundation. The apostles laid the foundation with the exception of few of the men, a couple of the men that weren't apostles that wrote the scripture to do this. And they were probably commissioned by the other apostles and given the accounts to write about. And so in a sense, they were given that governing ability to write that. And it was considered a can in the canon of scripture. But you're seeing that the apostles laid the foundation for the scripture. And it was prophetic in nature because it was testifying of Christ. And it was also apostolic because the apostles are still ministering us to us today through the word of God. Now, there were other things that the true apostles of Christ were given the authority to do. They were given the authority in the first century church to govern the church, as we see the Council of Jerusalem that was established in the first century church in the Acts of the Apostles. We also see that true apostles were able to do signs, wonders, and miracles, and this authenticated their ministry under Jesus Christ. This was to validate and authenticate their ministry in accordance with Jesus Christ, and we know that these were true miracles that took place. They were immediate miracles that took place. They were supernatural in nature, and they testified of Jesus Christ every time. And, you know, pr we praise God that God still does heal and still does miracles today in accordance with his will. However, these were actual unexplainable things that happened there, and they were immediate, such as a lame man walking out after 40 years laying at the gate of the beautiful gate that people recognize as a crippled man who in an instant immediately what is what the word says immediately that he gained strength in his legs and he leapt up and he began to praise and worship God and he was walking. So there were several things that that were prerequisites for an apostle of Christ. And again, one of the biggest ones I want to point you to, along with laying the foundation of Scripture and having the authority to write Scripture, which no one today has that authority, is that a man called as an apostle had to witness the resurrected Christ and had to have walked with him during his earthly ministry in order to witness his resurrection. But Paul was one of untimely birth who did not witness it, but he was ministered to and witnessed the resurrected Christ, ministering to him the gospel and calling him an apostle. So the last little bit of time that we have, we've covered a lot of ground with scripture, and I encourage you again, open your Bibles, read what I had read to you, and do your own studies. Obviously, there's other passages that we could turn to that talk about the apostolic in here, but those are some of the biggest ones that I wanted to highlight and to touch on today for this lesson. But I want to talk about the NAR for a little bit. And the NAR is, I heard a lot of people talk about this, uh, and it's, it's hard to pin down. And when you go even try to look on people's websites, you're not going to see that they claim to be a part of it. It's not really a necessarily an organization. It seems rather fluid or something hard to nail down. However, when I think about the New Apostolic Reformation and I think about what I came out of, I think of the NAR as a multi-headed beast. And in, what I mean by that is I think of it with these multiple heads of 
different aspects of different movements from the past. I think for one thing, when I think about what I came out of, there's a a head on it that almost has traits of the shepherding movement, which is uh, one aspect of it was the covering. I remember hearing a lot of teaching about you don't want to come out from underneath your spiritual covering. If you come out from underneath the church or your spiritual covering, you're opening yourself up to attacks by the devil, or you're going to operate under a curse because you come out from underneath your covering. So that's an aspect of the shepherding movement. We see other aspects of it, such as the word of faith movement. Uh, That was a big part of what I came out of. The the church I was initially for years, they focused a lot on Hagen's teachings. In a sense, I remember even even in the quote Bible school that I was part of that I sat in for for several years, a lot of the teachings were um, teaching from Kenneth Hagen's books. He was known as the father of the word of faith. But when you look at the roots of the word of faith, it goes some, a lot of it's traced back to new thought, to the metaphysical, and basically believing that your words have power. They also taught of Jesus Christ have, taking on Satan's nature and having to go to hell and to suffer, which that's not found in scripture. Uh, there's the little God's belief that we are all little gods. This all stems from word of faith. And so there were things that I wasn't taught there, but then when I'm looking at it after coming out of this, and I started researching more, I started tracing this stuff back to Word of Faith and realizing that this was ingrained in it. It was entrenched in it. So that's another head of the NAR that's been infused onto that. Then you have the prosperity gospel. That's also another head on this multi-headed beast. The prosperity gospel of the name it and claim it, uh, that you are supposed to always be healthy, wealthy, and wise, that you're never supposed to lack anything. And if you do or you don't get healed, then there's something wrong with you. Same thing in the Word of Faith, that your faith isn't strong enough or you have hidden sin in your life or you didn't get enough or you didn't do this or do that. It's really works-based when you start thinking about it. When we're creating a gospel where we have to do something in order to achieve a new level, achieve a new sound, achieve a new wineskin, that's another uh, common thing I heard a lot was we're always going for the new, the new wineskin, the new sound in worship. Uh, if we got to create a new sound in order to unlock the ministers, I remember hearing that. You, you keep hearing everything about the new, the breakthrough, the new dimensions, the new paradigms, uh, always focusing on something else, something fresh, rather than focusing on the word of God and understanding it in context, which is really interesting to me when I think about it, because when you have people even today that are professing that they're apostles and prophets. And even some people may say, well, you're misunderstanding the word apostle because an apostle can also be a missionary or a church planter. And some people do hold to that. But what I'm talking about today are people that actually believe they are apostles. They've been called that and ordained that whether they pay for it by and receive a certificate or they come under an apostolic network And they still have to pay to be part of that network. And depending on how much they pay into it and how much they give depends on what tier of uh, relationship they're on uh, in those a lot of times. But when you're talking about apostles today, people who call themselves big A apostles and they want to be referred to as an apostle or prophet or what have you, they really view themselves as the upper crust of the church that they govern. And you are to listen to them and what they say carries weight, that they are anointed, which if you look in first John two twenty, all believers are anointed. There are no little believers and big believers. There are leaders and we are to respect and respect leaders that are over us, but we are also to test people, test teachings. We are told to do that. We don't need a title to test things. And just because you test things doesn't mean that you have a devil. Or that you have a religious spirit, which there's no mention of a religious spirit in the scriptures whatsoever, along with a lot of the other spirits that are mentioned that are concocted up in these movements. So you have a little bit of the shepherding movement. You have a little bit of the word of faith or a lot of the word of faith, which is what I initially came out from under, but it morphed into the new apostolic reformation. And the last probably six or seven years I was in that ministry uh, was when the, the leader began to embrace being an apostle. And operating in that and going after that pretty hot and heavy and focusing on that. 
So you have that, you have the prosperity gospel, you have the hyper charismatic, which is where you have the, uh, the manifestations of the miracle signs and wonders. You have fire tunnels, you have prayer mapping, you have all these different aspects, the seven mountain mandate, you have that's that, which that goes into dominionism, dominion theology, post-millennialism. You have all these heads that are on this beast, so to speak. And again, I'm not speaking from revelation, but this is this is just the best way I can categorize it. It's a beast with his multiple heads fused on it. And they're pulling from all these different past movements. I mean, even the latter rain movement, uh, the, I believe, uh, when you see the people like William Branham, they're still, the, the NAR is still wanting to infuse that man's ministry into their movement. And I would encourage you to study about this man and don't just go to books that are going to paint him in a great light, but go to resources that are going to help you to understand his ministry. There's things you may not know about him. For example, you may not know that he actually ministered at Jim Jones's church. If you're not familiar with Jim Jones, you might want to look him up. He was the man that had the um, the church in Jonestown in South America, I believe, in the 70s. And he was the one that had all the people, about 1,100 people with children included, drink Kool-Aid, and they died in mass suicide. So... William Branham ministered at his church, the People's Temple, during the 1950s. William Branham had false prophecies that never came to pass. William Branham believed in the in the serpent seed doctrine. He believed in the, the Zodiac, the pyramids, and the Bible had equal authority as for understanding. He did not believe in the Trinity. He he believed that he was one of the angels of revelation. There's a lot of things. If you begin to look at some of the ministry of this, we should have no part with people that are ministering something that is anti-biblical and against scripture. But this is another part of it, the latter rain movement. They'll, they'll start bringing in some of this and, and infusing all these different past movements into all of this and creating this multi-headed beast that is trying to feed and to integrate all these other things in and to become more powerful. And you'll see, you know, again, you'll see people gravitate towards the, the miracle signs and wonders, the manifestations. We've got to focus on seeing feathers and gold dust, and we've got to see the Holy, the a massive focus on the Holy Spirit. And we forget that, you know, Jesus even said that the Holy Spirit would testify of Christ. The Holy Spirit doesn't draw attention to himself. He draws attention to Jesus Christ. That's what he does as a minister through us, indwelling us as believers and testifying of Christ and conforming us to the image of Christ and this progressive sanctification that we're walking through. He conforms us to the image of Christ so that we are glorifying Christ and, become, and knowing how to, how to worship him in spirit and in truth and knowing how to discern what is evil and what is not. So you'll see in this movement that that you'll see that with the apostles in, in this time now that, you know, for example, they'll even refer to Acts chapter 2. They'll refer to, I've heard this before, that they'll refer to the, the believers there in Acts chapter 2 after they were born again, that they were focusing and devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, and they'll misappropriate that scripture and say, well, see, just like these believers then were were devoting themselves to the apostles teaching you are to devote yourself to our teaching today because we're apostles that's not what that scripture means it means that they were devoting themselves to the apostles teaching and as disciples we should be learning from that and devoting ourselves to the apostles teaching as well which is the scripture okay now, this resource, before we end, we'll spend the last few minutes talking about this resource I mentioned to you at the very beginning of this podcast. There is this great resource I encourage you to check out. It's by uh, Douglas Givett and Holly Pivick, and excuse me if I'm not saying uh, Douglas's name right. It's a great book. It's, uh, there's actually two books, but this one I'm holding in my hands right now is called God's Super Apostles. The other one they have is called the New Apostolic Reformation. It's a more thorough book. I have it on my Kindle, but God's Super Apostles, I actually have the hard copy in my hands. And so just to touch on a little bit of this, they talk about apostles in this book, for example, and refer to them as super apostle, the God's Super Apostles. And they say here, I'll just read a couple of different things I have highlighted because I'm a highlighter and marker in my, my books. I like to dog tag and highlight and mark and write and all kinds of stuff so I can go back and remember things and refer back to things. So on page eight of their book in God's Super Apostles, they write, many NAR leaders teach that apostles hold the most important office in the church. They are the equivalent of generals. I cannot tell you 
I'm, I'm telling you this myself. I'm not reading the book. I cannot tell you how many times I heard that I, I was under a general of the faith or, you know, talking about the generals of the faith and that they, the apostles today really do view themselves as generals. And they go on this book to say all other church leaders and what they call their apostolic network, including pastors, are expected to submit the, to the apostles' authority. This is absolutely true. If you question in any capacity or if you even bring complaints or concerns or anything, that is not okay to do that. And it's not even okay to bring your concerns to the leadership underneath the apostle, because when that happens, you'll be told that you're in rebellion, that you're in rebellion. Honor is a very big thing in this culture of the NAR. If you question it for any reason, if you question the authority, the question, the apostles, their teaching, what they've said, how they've conducted themselves, any, in any way, whether a deep thing or, or not, which knowing what I know now, two years later, I'm coming into two years um, in May of being out from underneath the, these teachings. And it was, um, I hate using this word, but it was a deconstruction. And at the same time, it was needed because I was able to start back at the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to build back on that in a proper way to tear down the things that needed to be torn down that were not biblically rooted and to begin to rebuild back on the foundation of Ephesians 2.20 and to begin to unlearn and then relearn some things that were truth. And one of the things that I had encountered in this ministry at the end is that uh, honor is a big deal. Rebellion is a big deal. Questioning is a big deal. The apostles are not to be questioned and there's a cost to that and there's repercussions from that. So that is absolutely true. They, they view themselves as a high authority in the church and a governing authority in the church. C. Peter Wagner was actually the one that coined the term New Apostolic Reformation. I have some of his books that I had purchased from thrift books and I had glanced at them and read through them. And he was the one that actually coined the term new apostolic reformation. So this is not a term that has just been concocted up in out of thin air by people that are conspiracy theorists. This was coined by this man himself who was a, a researcher of church growth. And he went to seminary and began to look at these things. And uh, this is a, this is a quote from him. He says, uh, C. Peter Wagner said, Of all the changes involved with the emergence of the New Apostolic Reformation, the most radical of all is the following, the recognition of the amount of spiritual authority delegated by the Holy Spirit to individuals. Uh, this book goes on in, on page 10 to say, A pastor submits to the authority of an apostle when the pastor voluntarily joins an apostolic network. Now, the ministry I was part of, there was an apostolic network. There is to this day. And to my knowledge... There are certain levels that you can be on that, uh, in that network, and depending on your level of giving and, and such like that, that you probably have more closer access to an apostle, and that probably is the same across a lot of these networks. But basically, in order for a pastor to be relevant, in according to these apostles today, and I use that, I should say air quotes with apostle today, in order for a pastor to be relevant and to be hearing what, what God, what they would say, what God wants to do and to happen today, you would have to be submitted underneath an apostle. It says a pastor also agrees that his or her church will contribute financially to the apostolic network. That is absolutely true. Uh, for example, Harvest International Ministry, an apostolic network of more than 20,000 churches under the direction of a U.S. quote apostle Cheon expects churches in its network to make a monthly donation. The recommended donation is between 5 and 10 percent of the church's monthly gross income. So the pastors have to submit to the apostles because the pastors are not authorized to advance God's kingdom on a grand scale. And behind the scenes, they will there are comments made about that the pastors are really viewed as lower than the apostles. And they will use the, the passage from Ephesians 4 and uh, also 1 Corinthians 12 to show, see, there's an order here and there's, a, there's a, a hierarchy, so to speak. And so they will use that as a way to, to prove a point that the apostles are the absolute governing authority and you are not to question because to question is to question God. And 
that is a big no-no. On page 10 of this book, it says, anyone who does not submit to the authority of an apostle is at risk. This is because an apostle's authority comes directly from God. And that's something else that I can attest to as well. Um, this is not permitted and uh, it's frowned upon to to question that authority and even to, you, you'll be accused of, of operating in a demonic realm by doing such, uh, by opposing spiritually, by praying against, by operating under a religious spirit or a spirit of condemnation or whatever they want to say, Jezebel, whatever that, that can be said. Um, you can be accused of witchcraft. There's a lot of different slanderous things that can be said, and they are damning because they are trying to condemn someone who is not even, in a lot of cases, trying to do anything except understand what is going on and wanting to have a better and gain a better understanding. And even in my case, two years ago, I can tell you honestly, at the time, I thought I knew what was going on. But at the same time, I was so confused because I began to realize that something was wrong. I knew it was almost like in a moment I woke up at the same time I was still in a fog because I knew something was wrong, but I didn't quite understand exactly all that was wrong until after I got out of it. And then I started looking more into the scripture and looking more and researching and researching, re- researching and devouring books and devouring videos and, and try and just getting in the word. I spent a lot more time in the word and trying to understand what I'd been a part of. And the more I found, the more my eyes began to open more and more. And the more repentant I was, the more sorrowful I was because there was so much deception. And then looking back even two years later, almost two years later, again, in May, it'll be two years. But looking back, I I would think if I had known then what I know now, I would have handled things differently. I would have asked different questions. I would have actually been forthcoming and in in asking questions about scripture, because at the time I was so fearful, honestly, there was a fear that was gripping me. It was not a spirit of fear, but there was a fear there, uh, really of man, because, and also too, there is a culture of fear in this type of movement, because if you ask questions, you're you're in, it's ingrained into you. And I was in this, this type of environment for almost 20 years. So I'm understanding more and more and I about what I came out of. But there is this culture there ingrained into you. You are honorable. You show honor to the leadership. You don't disrespect them. You stand for them and clap for them when they come to the, the, the platform or the pulpit. You you don't back talk them. You you show them honor and reverence. You you know, there's lots of different ways that, that you could do that. But it was always ingrained into you to conduct yourself in a certain way that you were uh, honoring the man or woman of God and that you were serving their vision and their plan so that way God could use you to carry out your, your plan someday because you were so loyal to that man or woman of God. But then it becomes this thing of really that you're placing a person on a pedestal that they should not be on and then... They, they don't believe that they're accountable to the church in the sense that a lay person or even another leader for that matter can come to them in that church and ask questions and such of any capacity or any nature. And then it becomes misconstrued and it uh, is over spiritualized. And so coming out of this, I look back and I think, well, I was really ignorant. I honestly was. I mean, I thought I knew so much and I thought it was all this spiritual, all, all the spiritual stuff going on. And there were some spiritual aspects to it, I believe. But honestly, there was such deception in what was being taught. And I was in that deception and I was part of that deception, sadly enough. And I thank God that he woke me up out of that deception. He mercifully opened my eyes. He mercifully granted me repentance out of what I was in. And now he's mercifully and graciously given me a small platform to be on to warn others and to minister to others that are coming out of this and to help those that will have ears to hear and eyes to see the truth and to come back to the true, simple gospel of Jesus Christ. And I don't mean simple in a backwards type way or someone that has no education. I mean the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of who God is, of what Christ did for us on the cross, of who the Holy Spirit is, what his role is, and where the fivefold, what the fivefold really does look like in the context of scripture. 
And for us to understand that there are major spiritual abuses that are taking place right now. We've seen a lot of things even in the past year or two. There's been a lot of spiritual abuses in the the so the quote prophetic ministry that we've been seeing. And I use that in quotes because a lot of it is not truly, it's not, it's not prophetic because if there's no preaching of the word of God, if there's no preaching and proclaiming, speaking forth what the written word of God says and calling people to repentance and calling them to, uh, to Christ and to the, and Christ and preaching Christ and Christ crucified, then that's not prophecy. That's not the, the speaking forth and the forth telling that's, not, that's taking place. Instead, it's divination and it's fortune reading and it's like opening, cracking open a fortune cookie. Uh, we're seeing these people that are calling themselves apostles, but they're running these pyramid schemes. They're running these pyramid schemes to where they're getting rich and they're, call it, they're telling people to get underneath them and to serve them and to give them so much money. And they're creating these own things in order for their own financial wells to get full so they can reap the benefits of it and still call it ministry. And so I say that again, not in a mean spirited way, but in a rather, in a humble way (laughs) to recognize what I was part of, to recognize my own deception, to recognize my own sin in all of this. And to, to say to those that will have ears to hear and eyes to see, Please open your Bibles, be a Berean, look at what you're sitting under, listen to it, take notes and go back and look at it in the word. And if it's not being taught in context, then you're probably sitting under something that whether someone is uh, truly sincere or not, you may be sitting under false teaching that is leading you astray and it's leading you to another gospel and it's leading you to another Christ. It's leading you to that Christ that cannot save you. There is only one Jesus Christ who can save us. He's the one that died on the cross. He was buried and he was resurrected. He did not go to hell. He did not take on our sin nature. He did not be, he was not tormented in hell by demons, by Satan. There's nowhere in scripture that tells us that he is the risen Christ when he said It was finished. It was finished on the cross. Every bit of payment for our sin, the propitiation that satisfied the wrath of God was poured out in his blood and by his life on the cross. And it was finished in that moment because he said it was. And he was buried and he was resurrected and he sits at the right hand of the father and he's coming back again for his church. He's coming back for a spotless bride. And it's not because of our works that makes us spotless. It's his completed work that makes us spotless. And that we understand as believers in Christ, we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. And in Ephesians 2.10, it tells us that we uh, were created for good works. We are God's workmanship and we were created for good works beforehand by God. That means that we do works not because we have to, but because we love God and we want to. We were not saved by good works, but we're saved for good works. And let me tell those, those brothers and sisters in Christ who are in this type of movement and you feel like that you are, you don't even realize it, but you're in spiritual bondage. When you're in a type of movement where it's always pounded into you that you just have to keep giving so much more. If you just keep doing this, if you just keep doing that, God's going to move in your life and do what you want him to do. If you'll just keep doing, if you'll just keep striving in your own efforts, if you'll just keep giving more money, if you'll just keep this, this, and this is jumping through hoops. There is such that's bondage. And I'm not saying that, you know, we're not supposed to give and, you know, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying we're not supposed to give and we're not supposed to serve in the ministry. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm telling you is when someone keeps telling you that in order for you to walk in the blessings of God, it depends on you obeying and then God releases the blessing. That's the law, guys. That's law. That's that's works based. That's not based on the truth of the word of God. It's not that's not freedom. That true freedom is knowing I am saved by Christ. I am saved from the wrath of God by what Christ did on the cross for me. And I don't do good works because I feel like I have to or I'm obligated to or I'm trying to get something from God. I already have been given eternal life through Jesus Christ. I'm not trying to earn anything. I just love him so much that I have to testify of him and to demonstrate that I belong to him and that he's that the Holy Spirit indwells me and that I was made for good works to glorify God and that I demonstrate that I belong to God when I do good works, not because I have to, not because it's going to earn me anything, but because I was made for good works by God to glorify him when I'm born again. 
So I hope that this podcast has been helpful to you. I know it's been a longer one, but I wanted to dive into this and I'm probably going to do more topics about such things like this to help be helpful in the future. But in the meantime, I hope that this podcast finds you well. If you have questions, feel free to email me at info at lovesubscribe.com. And I look forward to being with you again on another podcast at another time. Be blessed. Thank you for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and on Instagram at lovesickscribe. And if you enjoy reading, feel free to hop on over to lovesickscribe.com and subscribe to my blog. I've enjoyed being with you today, and I look forward to our next time together as we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and we continue to grow together in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.